wrecked out y'all this morning. I want y'all to stand up on your feet as we begin to worship together. Sing about the great love of our God. Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years. Still I'll be singing. How can I praise you enough? How can I praise you enough? Come on, we sing. My feet rose 
supposed to dance But when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so clean washes over me You have made me new now life begins with you It's your love It's your love Rejoice as though heaven had lost. But did Jesus rose to God? Well, good morning. Welcome to Shelby Christian. It is a great sunny morning, even though we have rain, a little gloomy. It was beautiful last week for Independence Day, wasn't it? Had a great, hope you all had a great day. You all came back with all your fingers, I hope, like Jason asked us to. Um, I love Independence Day because I'm a history buff. So I enjoy learning about history and going to the sites. I've been up through Massachusetts. I've been to... Um, Philadelphia to Independence Hall and seeing the Liberty Bell. I've been to Valley Forge, but my favorite place is Washington, D.C. Now, I know when I say that term, a lot of times a lot of us have a very negative connotation about that place, but it's really beautiful with all the monuments to you know, World War II, to Korea, to Vietnam, to the Washington Monument, Jefferson, Lincoln, and I love going to the Smithsonian's especially a natural history museum and 
the Air and Space Museum. So when my daughter was in eighth grade and her class was going to take a trip to Washington, D.C., I was right there. I was like, yeah, I'll be a chaperone. I'll go. And they got a day to free to pick any of the Smithsonian's they wanted to go to. Of course, I'm pushing for natural history and I'm pushing for, for science, but my daughter chose the Holocaust Museum. Now, if you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum, it is a very insightful, but a very sad place. You go in, there's a huge box car where they actually took the Jews to Treblinka and to Auschwitz. And there are different stations you can go and you can listen to people who live through it, talk about it. But I think the saddest thing for me was walking across a bridge of hair where they cut all the hair off of them before they sent them into the gas chambers. Or the shoes. You walk across a little bridge and you see lots of little shoes and big shoes, shoes of all sizes. And it hits you here and you think about the fact that there was one madman who managed to kill over a million people. But when we come to this communion table, we are reminded that one man instead died for billions of people. Each and every one of us, Christ died for us. So as we go to these stations and we take our cup and we take our juice, let us be constantly reminded of the sacrifice he gave for us. One man who died for billions. Let's pray. Father God, we just praise you and we just thank you again this morning. You are such a good and glorious, awesome God. And Father, we pray as we do that you would just fill this place with your spirit. That you would continue to anoint Ethan and the band, Father. And that you would anoint Dave as he comes and speaks for us this morning. May your words speak through them. And Father, this morning we pray for our nation. We pray that you would continue to guide us and lead our leaders, Father that we would be the glorious city on the hill, that we would be a nation that would call you God, that it would actually mean what our money says, in God we trust. We love you, and we know how much you loved us by giving us your son. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
that line in that song about taking what the enemy meant for evil and turning it for good. I, there's so much stuff that goes on in our life that is really messed up. It, it doesn't make sense. And, and other than to say that the enemy is trying to destroy us, that's what we know. The Bible tells us his goal is to still kill and destroy. And, and to know that there is a God that takes what he meant for evil and to destroy us, and he will turn it for the good. There's no greater story than where we need to land today in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Um, this, there's, there's no hiding it. I, I mean, this story that Jason shared with you last week, is one of the ugliest stories in history. Not just in, this, not just in this series or in this journey. It's one of the ugliest stories in history. In fact, Steve Sparrar in his book, uh, Finishing Strong, says, the sin of David and Bathsheba may be the most famous moral shipwreck in all of history. And the cover-up? Oh my goodness, the cover-up was worse than anything that ever happened in Watergate or Benghazi. 
I mean, the things that went on there were horrible. And, and Jason shared the ugliness of David's sinful choices and adultery and murder last week. But, but for where we need to go this week, just in case you weren't here or for those that maybe are watching online or don't know all the details, David, this man after God's own heart that we have been studying all through this series, this man with the heartbeat of God has this fatal moment, this fatal moment and, and it's so telling the beginning of that story starts off in the spring of the year when the good men went off to war David stayed home he wasn't where he was supposed to be doing what he was supposed to be doing so that put him in a place where Satan could do something to him and work something against him and David looks down off the roof sees Bathsheba bathing decides to call her up calls her up they they have relations together and then she gets pregnant and David says, we've got a problem. How's this going to look? And so David, being a shrewd leader, he, he, he begins to cover up. And his cover up, as, as Jason talked to you about last week, his cover up was, well, I'll call her husband Uriah back home. I'll, I'll let him come back home from the front, from the battle. And surely they will, they will be together. And so then everyone, including Uriah, will think the baby is his. But... Uriah, being a great soldier, couldn't stand the thought of having an enjoyable evening with his wife when his comrades were still on the front lines of battle. And so he decides to sleep outside on the porch. David gets wind of this, and now we've still got a problem because he's, Bathsheba's still pregnant. And so he's, his next plan is send Uriah back to the front. Let make sure that Uriah gets killed in battle, which he does. And then David will take, Uriah, or take Bathsheba as his wife, which he does. And then everyone will think that the baby is a honeymoon baby. Everyone except David and Bathsheba and God. And, and, and so there's this problem that's brewing. Everybody knows one thing, but God knows the truth. Everybody thinks one thing, but God knows the truth. And so David, David, you, we, we, you had to take that moment. Jason did such a great job last week of laying that out. out. You had to take that moment and just imagine what's going on, the, the torment that's going on. And this man with the heartbeat of God, knowing, that, knowing what has happened, and, and the physical stress, the mental stress, the emotional stress, the spiritual stress, for nearly a year, David's soul is trapped. It's trapped in a place he couldn't escape. Maybe not for this particular thing, but maybe you've been there. Maybe it is something very similar to this, but you've been in that position where you've kind of been trapped in the, oh no, this, I, 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 I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with this. And so David kind of drags his way around for days and weeks and months. There's no happily ever after in David's mind to this story. But there is. There is a little bit of hope. There's a glimmer of hope that we're going to look at today that really comes because of one man's courage to confront and another man's willingness to repent. If you start looking there in the book of 2 Samuel, end of chapter 11, beginning of chapter 12, you know, we're living now in this era where, where there are jobs everywhere and we still can't get people to work. Imagine if you were trying to fill the position of confronter of the king. That's the position that you're trying to fill. The, the job description says anytime the king steps out of line, you're going to be the one to go get in his face and tell him what he has done wrong. Imagine trying to fill that job description. Now, if the job description was complainer about the king, that's a whole different job description. That one gets filled rather easily. But to be the guy that has to look the king straight in the eye and confront him when he's wrong is a difficult situation. 
And so if you want to, if you just scroll back a little bit in 2 Samuel chapter 7, just real briefly there, we meet this guy named Nathan for the very first time. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, when we first meet him, he is sent by God to David to, to, to let David know David's got these dreams and these visions of building the temple. And God speaks to Nathan and says, you need to go let David know that because he's a warrior and has blood on his hands, I don't want him to be the one to build the temple. That job's going to be passed on to his son Solomon. So you've got, you've got David, and even at that time, still man after God's own heart. But yeah, there's, there's, there's a little bit of ego that has to be there. I'm going to build the temple of God. I'm, I'm going to make sure that this happens. I'm going to do this I'm, almost as a, as a monument. And no, David, you're, you're, you're not going to be the guy. And Nathan had to be the one to go tell him that. That's the first time we see Nathan. And then the second time we see Nathan is here in chapter 12. And Nathan is called by God to go confront David. I wonder if David, you know, like look at your cell phone. Oh, it's Nathan again. You know, you know come on, let's be, let's be honest. Those of us who have cell phones, let's be honest. Most of us, there are certain numbers that pump, pop up and you're like, Oh, really? <laughs> Not now. I, I think I'll just, they can leave a voicemail. <laughs> they can text me. And, and Nathan comes back on the scene, and David's like, really? And the last verse of 2 Samuel 11, which is at the end of the story that Jason shared you, with you last week, look at the last verse of chapter 11. It says, the thing David had done displeased the Lord. This thing displeased the Lord. So the beginning of chapter 12 shows us that God sends Nathan once again to confront David. Now, Nathan doesn't just come in and get all up in David's face. I'm guessing you probably don't do that to a king. I don't know. Even if you are a prophet of God. But Nathan decides to tell him a story. It's really a, a kind of genius way of presenting what had to be presented to David. And so I've just kind of rewritten the story a little bit. You might want to listen or you can read it for yourself. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, he starts off something like this. Or, hey, hey, David, there's these two guys, there's these two men in the kingdom, and, and they're neighbors. And David, one of them's rich, and one of them's really, really poor. And the rich man has flocks and herds out the wazoo. I mean, they're just like crazy. But the poor guy, he's just got this one little lamb. He loves that little lamb so much, and he, he holds the lamb. It's, it's more like a pet than livestock. He feeds it at the table. He even goes to sleep with it in his arms. Well, the, this rich guy, this rich guy, last week, there were, he had some company come in, some folks came in, and they were going to have this big banquet. And, and instead of slaughtering one of his hundreds of sheep for the meal, he stole his neighbor's lamb and fed it to the guests. David's getting furious. And then he says, what do you think should happen to that guy? How would you respond if you heard that story? I mean, if, if today just somebody calls you up and goes, hey, you're not going to believe what happened. And they tell you something like that. And somebody that just had it all did something horrible to somebody who was just struggling to get by. And, and David hears that and he responds probably a lot like many of us would. And David says, whoever did that, needs to be punished. Well, David said he needs to be killed. And now comes the moment of truth, right? Nathan has to look David in the eye and say, King, you the man. You're the man. Hey, hey, King, the gig's up. God knows that now we know it, and you're the man. You did that. You did that to Uriah when you took his beautiful young wife, Bathsheba. And Nathan has to go on and tell David that the punishment is going to be severe. This isn't just a little oops. This isn't just a little mistake. What you have done and the way that you've covered it up and the way that you've done all these things, this is a big deal to God, the one whose heart you were sharing and, and then we see God's judgment. And I really want you to dig in and look scripture here in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Look at verse 10. Here's what it goes on to say. 
Nathan says, from this time on, David, your family will live by the sword <clears throat> because you have despised the Lord by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, David, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. The sword will never leave your house. Now, if somehow in the you missed it, God is ticked. And he sent Nathan to tell David, this, there are consequences to what you have done. Some bad stuff is going to happen. That part about that I'm going to give your wives to, to, to someone else in public, it, well, it ended up happening to be one of David's sons took one of his wives uh, and, and, and brought daylight on the roof. And David's son, Amnon, one of his other sons, Amnon, raped his own sister, Tamar. And then Tamar's brother, uh, Absalom, killed Amnon because of what he did. And Absalom later led a revolt against his father, David, and was killed in battle. And another of David's sons, Ad Adonijah, tried to claim the throne after David died, and Solomon had to have him put to death. There is bad stuff that happens as a result of David's choices. We live in a world today that doesn't want consequences, right? Uh, we live in a world today that, that wants to believe that they can define sin in their own way. They can decide what's right and wrong. And as long as they believe it to be right, it's okay. And if they step out of line, there are no consequences. Now remember, remember this series is called Heartbeat. It's about a man after God's own heart. If anybody was ever going to get a pass, it would have been David. But there's no pass for sin. There's consequences for sin. And one of the hardest parts of this was that, that child that was conceived when David had the affair with Bathsheba, their, their son was going to die. And there's, there's no pain like the pain of losing a child. I, I attended a funeral on Friday for a 14-year-old boy who found out three weeks ago he had cancer and died this week. It, it, it was devastating. His family did nothing to deserve this. His family did nothing to cause this death. And, and, and there's, there's, there's several in our church who know this pain very well. You've gone through this pain of losing a child. It is so hard, and there is nothing that you did that caused their death. God's design was for us to live together. But can you imagine... Can you imagine the torment that David endured being told that his actions would lead to the trauma his family was going to endure, including the death of this child? Now, this is a very unusual circumstance, okay? In, in fact, I don't remember any other time in history that God intentionally took the life of a baby as a consequence for the parent's sin. It's the only time. But David was the king of God's chosen people. He was a man after God's own heart. He was the first king in the eternal kingdom that would ultimately give us Jesus Christ. God had a place of prominence in his life, and David had a place of prominence in our history that was so pivotal to God's plan of salvation, to God's ultimate plan of Jesus Christ, that God disciplined him in a way that almost seemed unimaginable. And, and as you think of it that way, there's that part of me that, that as I was typing this, I'm feeling like I found myself feeling like I needed to defend God for his actions. But guys, listen to me. The truth is, God is God. And he doesn't need our defense. He needs our faithfulness. See, here's, here's the problem we have when we, we read stuff like this. We now live in a judgment-free world. That's what we want to live in. This judgment-free world with judgment-free zones. And people misquote the Bible all the time saying, God says, you can't judge me. God says, the Bible says God doesn't even judge us. He loves us. One of the most often 
quoted things in social media and tattoos is this quote from Tupac that says, only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. And, and the thing is, what people don't realize is how true that statement is. Because in their mind, when they, when they speak it, it's a defensive statement saying, don't come at me. Don't go Nathan on me. Don't confront me. Don't judge me. And, and what they don't understand is how true their statement is, but they don't understand this about the statement. Because there are two things that are true about that statement. Only can God, God can judge me. Number one, God can. And number two, God will. That's the truth. That's the truth. And when it comes to our eternity, only God can judge us, but he will. He will. And so here's where I think we find ourselves at a really critical moment. Nathan has confronted David. He's, he's on God's behalf. He's coming. He's told him, here's, here's what you've done. The gig is up. God knows there's going to be punishment, and the punishment is going to be severe. How is David going to respond? Just look there, 2 Samuel chapter 12. At the end of that story of the confrontation, David says, I get it. I've sinned against the Lord. He comes clean. There's that moment where he, I, I get it. I get it. But, but there's some things that, that, that he's still where He's still a dad. And, 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 and this baby has been born, but Nathan told him that this baby's not going to survive. So David goes home, and the Bible tells us that David goes back, and he lays next to that baby boy. He just lays down, and he's right there next to his boy until the boy finally dies a few days later. And then one of the most telling things in Scripture, it says that after the boy had died, David got up, cleaned himself up, and went to worship God. Wow. Because David understood what had happened. David understood who God was. David understood his error, his sin. And so the remainder of the story, what we get to see that is so cool in Scripture is, we get to see David's repentance and his restoration. Yeah, the confrontation from Nathan, that's no fun. God's judgment, that's no fun. But the great part of this story is that we actually get to see David live a restored life. And guys, I hope that gives us hope. That no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, we can be restored. Because see, David's relationship with God was restored. He experienced the overwhelming joy of a second chance. I want you to flip a little bit further into the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms. Because a lot of you know that David wrote a lot of those Psalms. And if you flip over to Psalm 32, the first couple verses of Psalm 32 say, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. Blessed is he whose sins are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, the reason that the Lord's not counting the sins against them is he has repented. He has come clean with God. He has asked, and God has granted grace and forgiveness. Restoration came to David. But you need to know, it took time. Restoration came, but it took work. Restoration came, but it took true repentance. Flip on a little bit farther over in your Bibles to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is one of the most famous psalms. It is one of the most personal ones where we get to see the repentant heart of a man after God's own heart. I want you to look down, uh, starting at the beginning of, of, of Psalm 51, and you're going to see David honestly, honestly confesses the severity of his actions. And he says, have mercy on me, O God. Yeah, you, you know, he's, he's writing, but you've got to get this mental picture of David just like falling face first in front of God. And to have mercy, 
Have mercy on me, O God, uh, uh, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my sins, my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know, I get it, God. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. I can't get it out of my mind, God. I need you to help against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you have proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. David took responsibility. That's the first thing that I think we need to learn as we see the repentance of David is that he honestly confessed the severity of his actions, took responsibility. Notice what he didn't do. Notice what he did. He didn't blame Bathsheba. David didn't come say, well, God, you know, she, she looked fine, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, come on, God, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a dude, you know, and she, she looked, she looked really good. There's no part in this whole story that David blames Bathsheba for what happened. There's, there's no place in the story where he blames anybody else in his world. There's no place where he says, well, if my other wives had been as responsive to me as she was, then that would he, He's not blaming anybody else. David's owning his stuff. David's truly, truly repentant. He owned his sin and honestly confessed the severity of his actions. Second thing David did was he humbly asked God to forgive his sins. Look on down in verse 7. He says, cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. You know, when, when you, you're doing something outside, you're working on the car, guys, maybe, and you, get, you got oil, and it's under your fingernails, and it's everywhere, or you're working in the garden, and, and no matter how much you try, there for the first couple of days, you've got that dirt stain and fertilizer stain, and you just can't get it off, and you just want to be clean. Or, or heaven forbid, you've been in, you've been in an accident and there's, there's blood and you just want to get it off of you. And, and David's saying, I just want to be clean. Would you clean me and make me feel whiter than snow? And see, guys, that's one of the beautiful things, I think, in the imagery of what God designed in our way to come to him now and our way to, to, to receive salvation, forgiveness of our sins. That's one of the beautiful things that happens in the baptistry. Is that you go in the baptistry, and it may not be like physical, literal dirt, but all that stuff that we've all got, we've all got that stuff that, that's kind of on us, and we feel like it's in our pores. And I've had so many people, come, they come out of the baptistry, and, and they say, that's the cleanest I've ever felt. It is. Because you've been washed whiter than snow, forgiven of sin. He says then in verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. And let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Um, blot out all my iniquities. Create, here it is, create in me a pure heart. That, that, remember that man after God's own heart? David said, I want it back. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit away from me. David realizes that there is nothing he can do to make this situation right. Nothing he can do. He can't work hard enough. The only thing they can do is ask for God's forgiveness and restoration. And here's a key point. David realizes he doesn't deserve it. David realizes that he doesn't deserve God's forgiveness. He's not demanding it because somehow he feels entitled to it. He's begging for it because he realizes that he's helpless without it. How many people today feel entitled to God's grace? Maybe, maybe that's part of your story is that, well, yeah, God, God's a good God. God's a loving God. God, is, God loves people so much that it really doesn't matter what I do. He's just going to keep loving me. And we feel entitled to his grace. 
the Roman people felt entitled to his grace. And they said, well, well, if grace is a little grace is good, a lot of grace must be really good. So let's just keep on sinning and just keep on getting grace. And Paul said, are you crazy? That's a loose translation. It's accurate. He said, are you crazy? You think you just go on sinning so that God's grace can get greater? No. David understood that he didn't deserve God's grace or forgiveness. See, repentance doesn't just mean we're sorry for what we did, or like for a lot of people, that we're really just sorry that we got caught. Let that sink in. Repentance means we want to make things right. It, it means we want to change direction. It means we want to get back on track. Like Billy Graham used to say, it, repentance means being sorry enough to quit. And that's where David found himself, honestly confessing the severity of his actions, humbly asking God to forgive his sins. And then we see him in verse 12 and 13. We see him willingly allowing his failures to help others. Look at verse 12. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then look at verse 13. Then I will teach other transgressors. I will teach other sinners. I will tell everyone your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. That'd be so tempting. That'd be so tempting. You know, when we get busted, you know, and, and there's that moment when we get busted, whether it's by our parents or by, by our teacher or maybe by the police or a spouse. Hey, okay, yeah, you got me. Can we just keep this between us? You know, I, I get it. Yeah, but like, you know, or like when we were kids growing up and mom busted us and like, okay, yeah, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry. Just, can we not tell dad? Can we just keep this between us? And, and, and it had to be so tempting for David to do that. That's what we do. Don't, don't, don't tell anybody about it. I know, don't, don't tell anybody about my affair. Don't, don't tell anybody about the things I did that ended me up in bankruptcy. Don't tell anybody about my addiction or my DUI. And verse 13 is huge. David simply says, restore me, forgive me, and sustain me. And if you do that, and when you do that, I'm going to tell everyone so that they can turn back to you. In the recovery world, step 12 of the 12-step plan is to go and share the message, to carry the message, to take whatever God has done in your life and go share it with other people so that they can find that same grace and forgiveness. So David confesses the severity of his sins. He asks God to forgive his sins. He allows God to use his failures to help other people. And then in verse 15, we see that he starts charting a new course for the future. Look at verse 15. David's pleading still. He says, oh Lord, open my eye, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. If all it took was another lamb to be sacrificed, I'd already done that. You, you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God, the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise anymore. See, David knew that he had sinned. It broke God's heart, but it also broke his heart. See, there's a key of realizing just, just how much we've done. Just realizing how much we've done, that we've broken the heart of God. That's what sin is. You see, the word sin actually comes from a Greek word that literally means missing the mark. It's an, it's an archery term. It, it's an archery term that is used to talk about any arrow that doesn't hit the bullseye. And on that particular target, it doesn't matter if it's in the red zone, the blue zone, the black zone, or the white zone. Anything outside of the bullseye is sin. Anytime we get outside of the center of the will of God, we are sinning. And we need to understand that. And we need to own that. The bullseye is where God wants us to be. The only place we're not sinning is, is when we are in the center of God's will. And David says, oh, God, please bring me back there. Please bring me back to the center. And the last thing he does is he grasps the responsibility that goes along with his influence. I'm the king. 
I, I'm a man after God's own heart. I should have known better. And, and I've got to own my responsibility in this. Ken Blanchard said the key uh, to successful leadership today is influence, and not authority. You can put whatever title you want before or after your name, and that by and of itself is not going to give you influence. That title, that authority is not going to give you influence. You know what's going to give you influence? The way you live your life. The way you live your life. David understood the impact of his failure and his repentance. And, and, and his failure had consequences for others as well. And so I want you to look at verse 18 and 19 of Psalm 51. He says, O Lord, in your good pleasure... Would you now restore the nation? Would you allow Zion to prosper? Because what I've done not only messed up my life and our relationship, but it messed up a whole lot of things here. And God, I'm coming clean before you, and I'm asking you not only to restore me, but would you restore this nation? Would you restore these people? He, he, he understood that, that there needed to be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. David was wise enough to understand that sin was not just his own. He had a mess to clean up, not just with his family. He needed to help everyone under his influence to experience the same restoration that he did. Yeah, we've been going through this series, and we've been talking about David and, and all these characters and how they did it. Nathan, <laughs> Nathan had this position as the confronter of the king. Nathan confronted David for his sin. Now, David had to do the hard work of repentance. He confessed of his sin. He asked God to forgive him. He allowed God to use him to help others and made all the necessary changes. Wonder how their relationship was after that. Have you ever wondered how David felt about Nathan after Nathan says, David, you the man? After he calls him on the carpet? You think David tried to avoid him at Kroger's? He, he saw him in the other aisle at Walmart, and he went the other way. He did everything he could. What did David do when, when Nathan's name popped up on his phone again? Oh, no. Oh, no. What's going on here? The rest of the story is great, though. Because there are two things in Scripture that kind of answer the question of how did David feel about Nathan moving forward. See, when David, when David was ready to name Solomon as his successor, the one who would be the next king, he chose two men to go and anoint Solomon as king and to introduce him to the nation. One of the guys he chose was Zadok, the priest. The other guy was Nathan, the prophet. What an honor to proclaim the next king of Israel. And David gave that honor to the guy who had the courage to come to him and go, David, you the man. You the man. You got some stuff you got to fix. But the second thing is the coolest thing of all, I think. In fact, it's over in the book of First Chronicles in chapter 3. See, David and Bathsheba were now together, and they had other children besides the one who died. They had sons besides Solomon. And one of the other sons that they had, David, named Nathan. Wow. The guy who busted your chops. The guy who got in your face, the guy who said, David, you're the man. He paid Nathan the highest compliment he could pay. He didn't resent him. He thanked God for him, and he named his son after him. See, guys, this story, this story is one more proof of David's restoration. Would you guys stand with me? That we once again get to see a man after God's own heart. And here's the bottom line. Don't forget this. The joy of restoration follows the hard work of repentance. If you need to do something to get it right with God today, why don't you come on while we sing this song together. Creation's 
David had to get things right, he had to deal directly with God. The good news is you and I have someone interceding for us because Jesus has now come and will stand before us, will intercede for us. But we still got to come clean. I'm so glad you guys have been here today. If this is your first time, I want to encourage you, please stop out at the I'm New Wall out in the lobby. We've got a gift for you out there. Our team would love to just get to say hey to you. Uh, some things that are coming up really soon, next couple of weeks, on January 24th, which was two weeks from last night, there, our Marriage Matters Ministry is having another cookout. Uh, it's out on Vigo Road at uh, Scott LeCount's place. See Bobby Woods over here or some of the marriage team, and they can get you signed. <laughs> up for that. And then the next day, July 25th, uh, any of you that are parents, grandparents of elementary kids who have been thinking about accepting Jesus as their Savior and being baptized, Tiffany will be doing another Jump Start class, uh, and that'll be on Sunday afternoon. You can check with her and get signed up for that. Guys, thanks for being here. I, I love you guys. It's been good to have some time. I'm getting ready to take the, the second half of my time off. Uh, I've been watching every week. Jason's been doing a spectacular job, and you're going to enjoy the next two weeks as we finish up this series uh, on the heartbeat of God. See you guys.